Okay. Hello, welcome. Come on in. So we've got a couple people still coming through the door. Um, it's just about 2.45, so I'm going to get moving with my uh, talk about local development using Kubernetes. Uh, yeah, feel free. There's a good number of seats down here in the front right. Feel free to point people this direction if they come in late. <laughs> All right. Uh, so accelerating local development with Kubernetes. Um, I am Ryan J. You can uh, find me online uh, on Twitter, GitHub, and IRC. This is usually what my avatar looks like. Uh, I am a developer advocate at uh, Red Hat. And when I first submitted this talk, there were terrible things happening, and I believe there still are, <laughs> in the way that we describe, and by we, I might mean you, uh, how we all describe Kubernetes, especially when we're talking to developers, right? Uh, how many people in this room uh, feel like they are primarily a developer, more than an ops person? Awesome. All right. You hopefully have. And how many of you here are uh, have used Kubernetes for less than six months? Excellent. All right. Well, this is a very introductory uh, kind of talk. I'm going to try to use just the upstream tooling and show you as much as I can from there. And then we'll talk about what additional tooling you might want to layer on uh, as well. Uh, and so here's my, uh, let's go with, uh, so why are we so bad at pitching Kubernetes? I think it's because it's primarily, uh, you know, it was a tool that was kind of built by and for site reliability engineers uh, or operations folks or uh, really folks that are looking at use cases that are about system reliability, high availability, um, you know, there's, there's a lot in here that people kind of package into their description of what is Kubernetes, and it rarely has any type of value or, or any type of resonance with developers, and often it's loaded with boatloads of terminology that is just more insult to injury. You know, there's, there's load balancing, scaling, uh, delivery automation. The, these are all things that I could care less about when I'm doing local development, usually, right? Um, so this has kind of been a problem for the Kubernetes community, and they've just been l focusing on their core competencies, uh, which they should. Uh, they've been keeping, keeping their uh, eye on, on making things faster, better, more performant. Um, yet at the same time, if you ask a Kubernetes uh, core maintainer what is an app, they will very likely struggle to come up with a clear definition because there isn't a clear upstream definition in the Kubernetes community of what an app really is. Because a lot of it, they'll say, well, it depends. Are you talking about uh, you know, workloads, web, pro you know, there's, there's so much uh, in there. I mean, people started off with uh, Docker was going to be what solved it all. We'll containerize all the things. And then as soon as people realized we need to scale these, decompose these monolithic applications, reflect what's happening in the microservices community, and allow these pieces to be scaled independently, um, then you see this model start to fall down and people go from Docker images to maybe swarm files to Kubernetes spec files, maybe onto charts eventually. Um, there's also uh, a proposal around using label selectors where you could do a, a Kubernetes command line uh, query, get all dash L to match on label selectors and then look for this label with whatever your app name is and whatever the response from the API is, that's, that's what your app is, right? But that's not a very uh, clear standards compliant uh, definition that we can, that's developer friendly in any way, right? Especially if they don't already have 
uh, you know, a, a lot of Kubernetes access to play with. So there's a proposal I've linked to around label recommendations. I think if you're an app developer, definitely look into whether this proposal fits the bill for you. Does it meet your needs? Uh, does it make sense as far as how we model apps? Um, I think there's still a lot more work to do in helping define this term. Um, but what you can do in the meantime is start talking about Kubernetes in, in a way that hopefully makes a little bit more sense to de developers, and I'll try to show that today. So this is where I want to get us. I don't know if we can get there today, but what I want everyone to confidently say eventually is, why Kubernetes? Development velocity. That's why, right? Um, but it, that's not the uh, agenda of, of today, you know, the, the conference. So I'm going to do a, a quick kind of a, a case study to help illustrate this uh, kind of conversation of how I would pitch Kubernetes uh, locally to my team and uh, to guide us through this with a kind of a, since we're in Austin, uh, kind of a music-based analogy, if you will. Uh, so this is a theoretical uh, company, um, Enterprise Records Incorporated. Uh, here's a picture of the band. Uh, I'll point out a couple of folks. We have uh, here up at the mic is our, our uh, architect or perhaps a lead developer, but someone who is definitely running the show, right? Uh, he's our front man. Uh, just behind him, we've got Will Farrell. That's our, our front end web developer, right? <laughs> and uh, the product team is over on the uh, far end in the, in the, in the nice jacket. Uh, so generally, Operations teams will come in and, and they'll realize that you know, the, the, the dev team's been working nonstop. They've been accumulating technical debt. They want to help increase your overall velocity as a company, but they know they need to fix some architectural things in the process, right? And so uh, you, know, you may come home from KubeCon and start blathering to everyone in your company about, hey, how, look at stateful sets and look at this and, and throwing out term after term. And if you're not careful, uh, people are going to be like, what is this guy talking about? Why is he so obsessed with things that have nothing to do with what we're responsible for? We need to ship. We need to ship product, we need to ship features, and we need to ship them faster than our competitors, right? We, we're not shipping Kubernetes, we're not shipping developer tools. Uh, go find the best in the industry, use those, and let's get back to business is generally the conversation and the uh, inertia that you need to overcome. Um, they're always gonna want more, and the web team is going to honestly want to know how do I maintain my velocity while using containers? It's a fair question, and the Kubernetes community needs to have a real answer. So I've tried to package, so don't screw it up for us, Gene. We need to get there to container town. We need to roll out Kubernetes. Uh, this is my approach to breaking through to the rest of your team. Uh, minimal onboarding. I think your number one message should be getting started is easy. Uh, we'll cover getting started uh, briefly. Um, share what you need to know, share what you do know, and model your I.O. As application developers, one of the most critical things you're going to have to be aware of when you're developing container-based solutions is if you have random writes going to some part that you're caching image uploads, or you need to model all I.O. and mark certain folders as being read-write, certain folders as being uh, read-only, use read-only whenever possible. And if you expect that data to stay around, you're gonna wanna use a volume or uh, some kind of persistence mechanism. So make sure as developers, that is clearly in your scope to know where your data is as you're operating on it. Um, and then the third one is really kind of evaluate uh, what's available as far as tool chain goes, and, and choose what's the, what's the best of the day. Uh, so here's the easy part. Um, Minikube start, that's it. It's one command. Uh, well, there's one other curl. You could do a, a two commands if you want to do a curl and then pipe it into your user local bin. You, know. uh, you could do a, a one-line install and then a one-line boot up, essentially. Um, but Minikube start is the easiest way to get going. I'm going to open up a terminal and just paste in, just so you could see 
how easy it might be. Um, this is using a virtualization mechanism to spin up a VM. They also have a new way you could do dash dash VM provider equals none, and then it'll try to skip the virtualization and spin up Kubernetes using only containers. You need a Docker engine or something for that, but uh, looks like I'm up and booted. I didn't need to sign up. I didn't need to wait for the ops team to provision any servers. I'm now unblocked, right? So that's, that's the, this is the easy part. Make sure that everyone knows not having a, a Kubernetes environment ready is not an excuse. Uh, staging's down, ops isn't ready, no. Everyone gets a Kubernetes. You all look under your seats, you all get a Kubernetes. Uh, Minikube is, uh, yeah, the, the best way to get started on that. Did I, yeah, Minikube start. I have a link to the official Minikube docs if you want setup help. I also have a uh, set of slides I put together. I do a lot of presentations, and so I've put together a series of getting started with Kubernetes that's all about half an hour to one hour chunks. Um, so if you end up at this bit.ly K8's mini cube, I've got about four different um, half an hour long chunks of one, one is just the setup, next one is uh, getting familiar with kubectl. So if you wanna learn more, I've got a, a whole series on that. Um, share what you know is the next big tip, and like I said, model your IO as developers. That's gonna be a major part of what you're gonna need to be aware of. Um, Here's one way I like to share what I'm working on. So if I'm starting from scratch and all I have is a, a repo and I've maybe, maybe a Docker file, I'm not gonna start you guys entirely like you don't know what containers are. I'm, I'm assuming you're, you're here at a Kubernetes conference. I'm just gonna assume you have a Docker file or a Docker image or some kind of container image that you could kubectl run. So if I do this kubectl run command, I can name my uh, application, if you will, uh, load this image, uh, and while I'm at it, I can also add a load balancer uh, that is compatible with Minikube, and then add this dry run flag. This is kind of a complicated example, but dry run allows me to do something particularly special that allows me to share what I know with other folks. So normally if I ran this command without the dry run, um, it would immediately go provision the new container using a deployment, and it would set up a service or a load balancer um, so I can contact this, uh, this web service. Uh, if I add the dry run flag, what, it, it, what it'll do instead is prep up all the JSON or YAML, depending on my dash O output, prep up all this data and write it all to standard out instead of to the API. This allows me to quickly generate manifests or spec files that I can share with my team. So if you're having trouble getting started or if you want to generate whatever your starting point is and then share that with a, 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 another web dev, um, try using the dry run flag as a way to generate your specs. I'll run an example of this so we could see what the output is. Oh, let's see, no outputs? Oh, oh, I piped it all to this metrics file. Here we go, metrics review. So it looks like the first data element I have is a service, um, and then I have a deployment. Um, so this is now something that I can take, oops, I can take that, run kubectl create dash f on that file, or hand it to someone else and, and allow them to run kubectl create dash f, and they have their local development now staged up with whatever I wanted to deliver, right? They have something, they, they are now at their, uh, I was able to deploy hello world. I haven't uh, iterated on hello world yet, but I've, I've deployed it locally, and that's one, significant step in your onboarding process for new developers. Uh, next, they're gonna wanna test that. Minikube service allows you to open up that new uh, deployed resource in your browser. It looks like this is still downloading the container, um, but it should pop open uh, in the browser as soon as that download's completed. 
Um, next up, I have an example of how I would use this uh, I.O. modeling or an aspect of I.O. modeling to enable uh, real-time iteration and development against this container I've provisioned. So I'm going to make a local clone of this repo so I have something to work with here. And if the Wi-Fi holds up, let's see, what we'll be doing is checking out a copy of this repo, we'll then using the minikube mount command to mount the repo folder inside the virtual machine, right? So now it's essentially exposed to the node or the host machine inside the Minikube environment. And I'm going to expose that inside the VM on var www.html. Uh, looks like I've got a little bit of a wait here. Let's see if there's a network cable. They told me there would be Ethernet. OK, here's our deployment has finished. So um, it looks like part of our download uh, happened. And hopefully that cleared up bandwidth for the rest of my uh, network connection. But this is what I was deploying. It's uh, some Kubernetes contributor graphs that I was uh, kind of tweaking on some, some data for con contributor graphs. And uh, this was an example project that I wanted to, to iterate on. So it looks like we've created the new open the browser session. We've got our local clone of the repo. Uh, let me get out of full screen mode here. Okay. Oops, too far back. Okay, here we go. Dry run. Modeling your I.O. We did the clone. Now I can mount this folder inside the VM. And I'll need to leave this window open to uh, keep that um, connection available to Minikube. Uh, next, I'm going to make a copy of metrics review. And I'm going to modify it. This is something that you will have to do by hand, unfortunately. But now that you have a starting point, it's easier to go in and look up what is a pod, what is a service, and then look up the actual spec, find out what fields and what values you might want to tweak, and then go based on the spec um, now that you have a valid starting point. Uh, so this, I actually have a completed copy of all of these modifications inside the repo at this, uh, stored in this file, metrics dev. Uh, dash YAML, but all it does is it takes the earlier file that we use dry run um, and adds a volume mount into the pod spec. Uh, so I'll take a quick look at that from the command line. It was metrics dev, so we could see Looks like there's some volume specifications. And it's going to do a host path mount from this folder on the node host into this folder inside the container. And if you look at the Docker file for this project, the entire repo is basically sitting inside this folder. So I'm going to mount a raw repo inside a running container that's basically serving this repo as, as static web. So it's, it's a trivial example, but what you ought to see is that I'll have real-time access to editing the HTML and CSS, and then I could just reload with my browser and use a full container-based tool chain. Uh, so let's go back. Now that I have the resulting file, I can minikube create on our metrics dev example. And then uh, if I really wanted to get fancy, uh, let, let's, let's take a look at, uh, let's see if that gets us anything. Let's go into Minikube service metrics dev. And it's, ooh. Let's see what happened. Not running yet. Okay. Uh, I think it's still downloading uh, or, or 
something's happening. Let's see, 404 not found. Uh, you know, what? It, I think it's having a problem with the mount, and I appear to be having a failed demo. <laughs> but what this should do is basically give you the same view as this page. Uh, the only difference, and I'll, I'll fix the demo, sorry about this. Uh, the only difference is I would be able to flip to the command line, um, edit the index file, look for um, my uh, title here, contributor metrics, and then change it to uh, Kubernetes contributor metrics, something like this. And then as soon as I reload the page on that dev version, I should immediately see the changes reflected in the browser. Um, that's basically the steps that you need to know. <laughs> Sorry I'm having this 404 error on my metrics dev, but uh, basically what we've done in the last five or so minutes is set up one uh, deployment to be used for real-time dev, and another deployment that I can actually uh, roll deployments to. And then I can do real-time development testing, and then once I'm s happy with those commits and I'm ready to ship that, then I can do a Docker build, still haven't committed yet, but do a Docker build, and then do a, uh, I can use this uh, minikube docker env command what that will allow me to do, it, it'll basically bind to the Docker daemon inside the VM, and then when I run Docker build, the result of the build goes direct into the VM, and I don't have to go out to Docker Hub and back down to my machine. So I could be developing fully containerized, fully offline in airplane mode, you know, while I'm flying over the ocean, um, and potentially have a full, you know, multi-service, uh, application deployed, developed, complete with Kubernetes all on my laptop. This is gonna boost uh, your, your memory expectations, of course, but if you're developing with small solutions or scaled down solutions, this gives you a much more production-like representation of what you're going to be working on and hopefully less surprises when you do go to promote your code to production. Uh, any questions about that? That's, that's the easy part. Any questions on the first half? I'll take a question quick, yeah. I found VirtualBox and Linux to be kind of horrible, so you mentioned the, uh, using the none for just using uh, containers. Is there a KVM support there or not really? So the, the question was, uh, what are the virtualization options available for Minikube? There's a pretty solid list. Uh, there's a K, libvirt KVM one. Um, I think you need one extra download to, to get that to work. Uh, there's also uh, support for using uh, the Apple native virtualization. Uh, uh, VMware Fusion, KVM, XHive, uh, yeah, a solid list, yeah. And all of that's available on the, the Minikube uh, docs. Yeah, Tom? Ooh, interesting, okay. Yeah, there's, there are, you will see sometimes mixed results if you're using different virtualization providers. Sometimes mounting external files into the VM works great with one, with VirtualBox, but not with KVM or vice versa, right? So some of these you may have to do some experimentation, figure out what's the best fit for your, I'm running on Linux here, but if you're on all, Apple, you know, maybe you want to use XHive as long as this uh, mount operation is working appropriately. Another thing that's going to be a big boost in the future, I'm having problems with this external mount thing. Um, in the future with, uh, with this latest 1.9 release, I know there's support for using a local uh, disk uh, for uh, per persistent volume claims. And so hopefully you could just lay out a larger size uh, virtual machine disk and then uh, use that disk for persistent volume claims and uh, other kind of persistence mechanisms that might, uh, should really help uh, with some of the modeling you're doing with Kubernetes. So now we get to the hard part. Uh, so 
Uh, you know, the, in some ways, you know, this is a popular quote, in some ways the future's already here, but man, it's, uh, it sure isn't evenly distributed. You're gonna have different teams with different uh, areas of experience, um, different requirements from different teams, and uh, you know, different people will be at different states of adoption. Uh, some of them fully containerized, some of them with a lot of legacy workloads that they are stuck with. So uh, this is a kind of a typical adoption path that I've seen. People generally kind of start with uh, playing with Docker. Eventually, they're going to need to start modeling their I.O., um, creating volumes, uh, persistence volumes, um, mapping those into the containers. Uh, hopefully, they pick up Minikube at some point and then have an easy way to model uh, Kubernetes abstractions uh, right on their laptop. And having that uh, as a, just a modeling language on your laptop, I find incredibly useful. Um, next, after that, you could definitely, if you're looking to share what you know, uh, look into charts. Uh, the, the Kubernetes charts are the official way of packaging up these solutions. They don't currently, uh, they're not, really labeled as the, the app definition, um, but they are the packaging mechanism for Kubernetes, if I'm not sure, you know, that's uh, kind of how they're described. Uh, OpenShift templates is another option, um, or you can use uh, your web developers. I'm sure you know how to do templating. You could use Jinja templates. You could use really any kind of templating system you're familiar with and hand roll your own specs once you know what you're dealing with, right? So maybe start with dry run, generate a couple manifests, and then figure out which values you need to uh, modify frequently and develop workflows for assisting with that. Whether it's hand-rolled manifest charts or, uh, you know, eventually people are gonna be looking at, uh, you know, this new service catalog or even leveraging a, a full pass solution. Uh, and really, the more you add, the closer you get to pass here. So, um, so I have a, a, from here I've got a variety of solutions that I wanted to give the audience an opportunity, but my theme for this is keep it simple, uh, make it, try, try to describe these in a way that is easy for developers to understand. Uh, so from the audience, who has heard of Draft here? Dra okay, anyone want to offer a description of, uh, it, hopefully without using the word container or Kubernetes? Anyone want to offer something? No? Uh, Tom, go for it. Actually, I got a mic as well. Tom? Yeah, I'm calling on you. Joe. Joe. I'm sorry, Joe. God. <laughs> Yeah. Jeez. Uh, okay, so in one sense, I guess I would say that draft is a, and this is almost direct quote from the official documentation, an event-driven scripting system for Kubernetes. Oh, close, close. That is close. Uh, anyone else have a guess? What I think of draft, draft is really kind of your, uh, so event-driven scripting system. That's next on my list. Thank you, Joe, and so sorry. <laughs> uh, Event-driven scripting system uh, is the next one. But Draft is uh, from the, the Azure team. It's the, I think, one of the best ways to get yourself a starting point. If you are not familiar with the dry run command or you want to get a good starting point, use Draft in your repo. It will attempt to produce a Docker file for you and your Kubernetes manifests so you can deploy. That's my lowest, uh, simplest tool. Make it easy to get started with draft. Uh, charts is my next one, and my simple explanation is, is just share what you know. Uh, Helm and Tiller, uh, have folks heard of Helm and Tiller? More folks than that have heard of charts? You use charts, Helm and Tiller is what deploys your charts. This is how you share, oh, come on. Okay, so, all right, here we go, here we go. Joe, would you like an op? No, <laughs> I'll quit picking on Joe. Uh, uh, Brigade is their event-driven system for producing workflows. If you would like to see a demo, head on over to the Azure booth. I'm sure they would be happy to give you a demo. It's a new project, so I don't have any demos prepared for this. But definitely, 
give it a look if you're interested in delivering workflow or event-driven systems. Um, I think uh, they've definitely produced a really good collection of developer tools in, in the past. Uh, how many folks have heard of telepresence? Not too many. OK, this one I think is particularly important if you're using Kubernetes on your laptop. If you are spinning up large numbers of microservices and you're on a MacBook Air, how far do you think you're going to get? You know, you could get a couple containers going, but with only a, a 8 gigabit memory max on your, on your hardware, you're going to run into some limitations real quickly. So you can customize Minikube and you could say, I want to give it more memory or less memory or, or you know, there's a lot of customization you could do there. You give it more CPU cores. But telepresence really helps pitch in by allowing you to leverage a hosted Kubernetes environment and then make those hosted services appear as if they're running locally on your local Minikube environment. So it uses uh, proxies, and so you could have a large, maybe you have a full-scale Oracle, big Oracle database somewhere else, but you want to be able to leverage, uh, hopefully not production data, but production quality services during your local development. Uh, telepresence is a good tool to look into. Access more with telepresence. Um, my last one's ManyShift and OC. I've got demos of ManyShift down in the Red Hat booth. When I submitted this talk, I was uh, in between jobs, and so I don't want to put too much vendoring in here. But uh, man, the more of this tooling you layer on top, the more complicated you get. Uh, the more you start to get into that problem of drowning people in terminology and getting distracted from your core mission of delivering product and features. And if it all, all the talking and all the um, communication goes to help accelerate your velocity and help the, bridge the communication gap between the dev teams and the ops teams, then that's exactly what it should be doing. But make sure you don't overwhelm people with uh, you know, a boatload of new terms fresh out of KubeCon. Try to give them just what they need. Give them a solid starting point. Uh, ManyShift and OC will uh, give you a, it's basically just like uh, ManyCube, except it spins up an OpenShift environment instead of a Kubernetes environment. OpenShift is uh, fully, uh, it's, a, it's a Kubernetes environment currently at Kubernetes 1.7 if you're using the OpenShift 3.7 release. Uh, so these basically give you a uh, more secure, multi-tenant safe version of Kubernetes. Uh, one of the unique things about it is none of your processes, we, we won't let you run jobs as root. Uh, it's not a best practice for folks at Red Hat to run every process at root as root. Uh, usually not a good practice in production. Um, I would argue if you're not doing it later down in your pipeline, why do it in local development if you don't need to run things as root in local dev, then why do it there either? But generally, Docker run and kubectl run is generally going to run things as the root uh, user. So uh, if you have PCI compliance, HIPAA compliance, any kind of uh, aspirations towards security at all, uh, take a look at OpenShift, and uh, I'd be happy to give you a demo of, of what we offer uh, down in the, the Red Hat booth. Uh, so hopefully, I've given you a simple overview, just a small couple pieces of what you can learn, uh, what you can share. Uh, here's a collection of other learning opportunities. Uh, the Kubernetes I.O. tutorials are pretty solid. There's also a good collection of uh, developer-focused education on the uh, Katakoda interactive examples. Um, I have a lot of developer-focused um, workshops packaged up um, using these Reveal.js uh, slides, and those are easy to fork and share. So if you want to fork any of my talks, feel free. Um, Steal them and, and uh, let me know if you get some use out of them. 
Uh, we also have an interactive learning portal at learn.openshift.com and a challenge to developers in the Red Hat booth. If you complete one section of our learning, learn we've got a, a free hoodie for you. Uh, so definitely stop by the Red Hat booth while we still got them in stock. Um, so developers want to get ahead, definitely model your I.O. and share what you know. Um, architects, figure out who owns manifest creation, right? Um, you need to have a solid way to maintain and distribute that. Uh, that's either going to be your dev leads or your architects, or, um, but it might not be your web developers initially, at least. Uh, QA folks, uh, look forward to saying, sorry, works on my Kubernetes. <laughs> um, operations folks, uh, mostly, hopefully it's getting pretty boring for operations folks, or it should be. Um, I know there's still a lot of work to do with Kubernetes, um, but primarily you want to be focusing on keeping the environment running, upgrading the environment, and not getting involved in uh, too much, uh, try yeah. <laughs> the, uh, yeah the, also, you want to loop in security. Um, security is a big uh, thing to keep in mind, um, and being able to organize your work in a way where you don't have uh, things like a situation where your front-end web developers are maintaining your Docker images and mm, having old versions of libssl or you know outdated core libraries, you want to have a solid mechanism for um, patching your workloads, monitoring your workloads, uh, doing a security analysis, vulnerability analysis on your workloads. Uh, so my send off for you folks, uh, definitely join the community on Slack in Kubernetes users and in SIG apps. Most of the developer focused content happens in SIG apps. Um, come and join the conversation, share what you know, share your use cases and experiences, and help us develop a range of solutions that expose or hide Kubernetes in an appropriate amount of visibility for developers, right? Uh, there's a lot of great videos on the SIG Apps YouTube channel as well, so definitely check that out. Uh, hopefully that'll help you learn to deliver consistent, consistently with containers, um, choose the right tools for the job. Uh, if, if you are building a PaaS, uh, recognize it and maybe use that tool, right? Uh, if, if you don't need a PaaS, hopefully I gave you a, a good collection of tools to leverage. Um, and uh, then hopefully you all get back to making gold records, right? Uh, that's about it for me. Thank you all for sticking around. <laughs> <laughs>